Delighted to welcome board members, advisors, staff, on-site visitors, online listeners, and Twitter followers. And please note that you can follow the State Board of Education on its Twitter page, at edstateboard underscore mc. You can also follow the meeting online and see all materials by going to SBE meetings at www.ncpublicschools.org. For our visitors and those listening online, today's agenda involves our board discussions on our agenda items and tomorrow's agenda is the official meeting date when the board will vote on its action items. We wish all assembled and listening a happy new year as we head into the first meeting of 2023 and we look forward to a year that's student focused as we continue to accelerate student learning following the throes of the pandemic. <coughs> Delighted to begin our uh, introductions today by welcoming uh, Mr. Henry Mercer from the Wilson County Schools. He joins us as our uh, local board advisor. Welcome, Mr. Mercer. We'll Thank have you a so more, much. We'll have a more formal recognition and um, in introduction for you tomorrow. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Also delighted and uh, want to thank local superintendents who are with us today and tomorrow. We appreciate your service and dedication to the students across the state. The superintendents that we understand are attending or will attend include the following, and if you'd please stand when I call your name, I appreciate it. Austin Obus Sahan from Duplin County, Otis Smallwood from Bertie County, Michael Bracy from Pender County, Jeff James from Iredell Statesville, Dana Ayers from Jackson County, Chad Beasley from Allegheny County, Todd Martin from Yadkin County, and Travis Reeves from Surrey County. If you're a local superintendent, including uh, our own Miss Bridges, would you please stand so we can recognize you? <laughs> Some of those superintendents are just very bashful. Dr. <laughs> so we'll look forward to uh, hearing more from you soon. The board members are reminded that it's our duty to avoid conflicts of interest and the appearance of conflicts of interest as we handle the work of this board. Does any member of the board know of any conflict of interest or any appearance of conflict with respect to any matters coming before us at this meeting? If so, please state them for the record. And if during the meeting you become aware of an actual or apparent conflict of interest, please bring the matter to the attention of the chair. It will then be your duty to abstain from participating in discussion on the matter and from voting on the matter. Colleagues, you've received the agenda and had an opportunity to review it. I ask if there are any requests for changes to the agenda. Hearing none, I request a motion for approval of the January 4th and 5th State Board of Education agenda. Motion by Mr. Hall. Is there a second? Second, second by Mr. Blackburn. Dr. Petrie Martin. Dr. Oxendine. Mrs. Camnitz. Yes. Mr. Keenan. Yes. Mr. Hall. Yes. Dr. Tipton Rogers. Mrs. White? Yes. Mr. Blackburn? Yes. Dr. Ford? Treasurer Falwell? Lieutenant Governor Robinson? Vice Chair Duncan? Yes. Chair Davis? Yes. Thank you, colleagues. We have an agenda. We'll now proceed to our student learning and achievement discussion led by Ms. Jill Camnitz. Ms. Camnitz. Thank you, Chair Davis. Um, I am uh, joined in the work of this committee with uh, my colleague, Dr. Olivia Oxendine. And today we start off, as we have been doing the last few months, with an update on the K-12 Science and Healthful Living Standards. Uh, Dr. Day. Good morning. Good morning. We are excited to bring some updates in the new year. Um, we will start off with a reminder of our policy, SDOS 012. That's the policy that sets forth our review and revision process for the standards. The next slide highlights the pages that you will find more details on our process in the internal procedures manual. A reminder for science and healthful living, all the pieces and parts are there. We are just in a hybrid approach because of our timeline. We'll start with science updates since the last time we have been at the table. We have completed and closed the PSU and stakeholder standard by standard survey for draft one of the science standards. That closed on December 18th and the data went over to the Office of Learning Recovery. Our next steps, data, data analysis will be provided to the data review committee. So our cycle that we started to, um, a few months ago with the current standard course of study where we go through the DRC and SWT will start again. So data analysis comes in, it goes over to the data review committee, they complete their report, which then goes over to the standards writing team, which is a separate committee of educators, and they will create the second draft 
based on the data and the analysis that's provided to them from DRC and the raw data by the end of January. Um, so the DRC will do that. Writers will start by the end of January, and we hope to have a second draft by the end of February. So those are science updates. Healthful Living, we had a DRC orientation and work session in mid-December. It went very well. The team worked very hard. The team of educators who will be providing that report and recommendations to the writers, they are continuing that work. That is not finished just yet. And then we have planned the standards writing team orientation and work session at the beginning of February. And then they will begin their work of creating draft one of the Healthful Living standards. Very quick update today. Questions for Dr. Day. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Day. Um, our next item of new business is an update on the National Student Clearinghouse, which is an exciting new partnership that Dr. Korn is going to tell us. Great. Good morning, everybody. I wanted to invite my colleague, Diane Delaney, up also, just in case there are any data questions, specific data questions that she might be able to answer. Um, this is a partnership between Office of Learning Recovery and the data and re the research and evaluation team and the data security team that Diane leads. Um, we are very excited to talk with the board today about a brand new kind of rich, robust, rigorous data set that the North Carolina has access to for the very first time. Um, as a state. This is called the National Student Clearinghouse. Um, the governor's office invested some of the GEAR funds to create a, our very first kind of partnership with the National Student Clearinghouse statewide. Um, and then the General Assembly in the last, in the short session during the budget cycle, um, actually created a recurring line item for this data. So as a state, we will have access to this data in perpetuity. And so, um, but since this is the first time as a state we've had access to it, we have spent a, the past couple of months really trying to think about how we maximize use of this data set, both as a state and then for all the high schools and districts um, in the state. Um, and what, so Maria, we can go on to the next slide. So what is very unique about this? about this data set is it is like 98% of the enrolling post-secondary institutions in the country participate in our members of the National Student Clearinghouse. So what that allows us to do for the very first time is see where every single one of our public high school graduates, where they matriculate into the post-secondary system, two-year, four-year, public, private, in-state or out-of-state. Um, and the way this data works, it's an eight-year data pool so what you're able to do is see what happens to your high school students to answer some of these questions. Where do they enroll? Where do they transfer? Where are they retained? Where do they graduate? What their, you know, what their degree is from? Um, if you guys remember the work when My Future NC had the My Future NC Commission, that was the first time we were able to get access to this data as a state. That's where Dr. Becky Tippett's kind of that the Leahy Education Pipeline data came from for the first time. But now, because of the commitment from the governor's office and the General Assembly, we'll have this data and are able to look at it. Individual students were able to work directly with our schools and districts, with our charter schools, so that they can really begin to unpack and understand the outcomes for the students that they are preparing in our public schools. You go to the next slide. Mm -hmm. So just a little bit about the National Student Clearinghouse. There are several links um, in your board materials. Um, but again, this is a, an out-of-state nonprofit. They're a membership organization with the post-secondary institutions, and they, has, they were created back in the 90s to do financial aid verification. They wanted to, all the institutions needed a way to verify that folks were enrolled, like a consistent way to do that. So that's that was the impetus of the beginning of this. And then re recognizing and realizing that once that data was all in one place, it provides a, a really, um, like a, a really robust way for both states, for high schools, for other colleges to understand what was going on with the students as they, and the pathways they took in, in post-secondary. If you go to the next slide. So the way that, that the and the partnership we have with the National Student Clearinghouse is called the Student Tracker. And so through that partnership, DPI gets a list of every single high school graduate from a graduating class. They send that information up to the National Student Clearinghouse, 
and then the data is matched there and then sent back to us. So, and it's an eight year long data pool. So every year we add the next, like the students that graduated from the next semester and it is regular and it's ongoing. And so we are getting rel pretty up to date information about where our students are going, where they're staying, where they're graduating. Next slide, Maria. And then the National Student Clearinghouse sends us back the, that linked data and they provide these aggregate student tracker reports. And they provide, it's a, a huge, like 40 some page um, PDF report for every single high school in the state of North Carolina. And we have a North Carolina level one that you guys, that, that we've linked into your board materials. But it allows you to see all of your enrollments. It allows you to see that persistence, completion, and also provides every high school a list of the top 25 colleges that are enrolling their students. You go to the next slide. And so folks are like, well, what are, you know, what are, they, what are high school principals or high school guidance counselors or as a state? What sort of things should we be doing with this data? Well, one, and so the National Student Clearinghouse has had um, a lot of experience doing this with other states. I think 43 other states have access to this data. So Diane and I have spent some time talking to our colleagues in other states about how they use, how they use the, the data that they've received. So one, obviously, is identifying partnerships with post-secondary institutions, both inside the state and then outside your state. Really talking with, converse, having conversations with IHEs about who they're enrolling, how they're recruiting, how they're partnering with our local school districts. Um, helping to understand the value that our schools and districts bring um, as part of that education to workforce pipeline. Um, really helping with informing counseling and advising, setting up college visits. We've already had a superintendent reach out to us and ask about how some of this information was calculated because he was very surprised about the institutions that were, the top institutions that were enrolling his students. If you go to the next slide. So this is just one graph of the 40 some that are included in the North Carolina level student tracker. And that's a link, um, the student tracker for North Carolina. But I think this graph is so powerful and is not something that we've been able to see before. So this is an eight year long data pool. These are individual students that graduated from our public high schools starting in 2015, 2014-15. And then it tracks those students all the way through the 2021 school year. And it's color-coded so you can see first-time college enrollees right after they graduate high school is that green bar, is that 60%, 60 percent, 60 plus percent. And then you can see persistence is the orange. The students that we all should be the most concerned about are the guys in the yellow. Those are the students that wanted to go to college, that enrolled in college, and then for whatever reason, did not go back. And the, you know, the hard part with this kind of quantitative data is that it doesn't tell us why, right? It doesn't tell us what happened to those students in yellow, but it could be financial, family, I mean, who, it wasn't a good fit. But for, for me, when I see this, those are the students to me that really could help us really meet our, that attainment goal that we are also committed to. Um, if you go to the next slide, Maria. And so wanted to provide the board just an update on kind of how we've been thinking about the rollout of this, of this new data for North Carolina. And again, with the intent that it be used. The General Assembly, <coughs> as a state, the governor's office has invested in this data, so we want to make sure that everybody is aware of it knows how to use it, knows what it is, what it's not. And so we have spent, um, the, the way we've crafted our rollout is phase one is this school year, that every single high school in the state received their local student tracker report. We did this in partnership with our accountability team as part of the Secure Shell because nobody had ever really seen this data before, wanted to give them a chance to review it as a leadership team, as a community. We did share the data with our partners over at My Future NC, and so every single county profile, and that's a link to the new county profiles, has been updated with this data, with this new data, and that partnership will continue. Um, 
and those profiles provide kind of a snapshot at the county level of basically pre-K all the way through the workforce. And so the National Student Clearinghouse provides probably eight to ten data elements on that county profile. Um, we have been providing regional face-to-face -face meetings. We have been we have been getting out into the field, making sure our guidance counselors and our high school principals and our superintendents and our PIOs are aware of this data. This spring, we're going to be doing regional face-to-face -face meetings with those same type of stakeholder groups um, and really helping folks that, you know, bring your reports with, with you to the meeting. Let's talk about what decisions, how this might guide your decision-making. Um, we've had some superintendents talk about including it in their local strategic plans. Um, district and school improvement plans. So that's very exciting. Um, and then just this morning, sent out some emails. Um, it, we've put a, a process in place for districts to get access to their individual student level data. Um, and again, we're trying to, this is a massive data set, so trying to think about the best way to facilitate that. So I'm um, working really closely with Diane and her team on how we can do that in a secure and safe way. Um, and then next year, once everybody kind of has a chance to get in and understand what this data is, would love to facilitate some conversations at the local and state level about whether we want to consider use of this data in our school report card. We have one data element called college enrollment, um, and it's it's developed using kind of local in-state data systems, but it doesn't include any information about the students that are going out of state. And so this data could potentially be a really uh, a richer, but we would need to have some conversations about that because it would change the, you know, the trend lines for some of that looking historically back. Um, we also have seen work in other states where they have post-secondary dashboards. want to say that, um, first of all, between this data set and the incredible amount of data that the Office of Learning Recovery has provided districts through the lost instruction time report, I think it's safe to say that our local school leaders have an unprecedented amount of data about their students. And I think what's so interesting to me about this data and the yellow group um, that, that we're looking at is that it allows us to see who is being left out, who is not completed, um, who is not persisting. And for what it's worth, you, Dr. Corn is exactly right. We don't know why. This doesn't give us the why. However, in 2017, I believe, there was a report delivered to the Board of Governors done at the UNC system that looked at non-completers just in UNC institutions, public institutions in North Carolina. And what they found was between 2009 and 2013, half of those who didn't complete did not complete because of low GPAs, and half didn't complete because of other factors, non-academic factors, like, as you mentioned, family issues financial issues. Um, I, I, I've heard presentations talking about, um, you know, students who have to return home to take care of family members um, or have children of their own to take care of, um, which again further shows the need for our two- and four-year systems to continue serving adults differently than they serve um, 18 
to 22 year old. Um, and so I, I think you're right. This is part of a, a larger conversation, but I'm incredibly excited about um, the possibilities of our local leaders to make data driven decisions. We actually got an email out of the blue saying thank you for they had never been able to get access. And we and I was like, how often does that happen? Do you get an email from a local high school? It was a high school principal um, that emailed us and said, thank you for getting us this ac access to this kind of data. So I was um, pleased that it was getting in the hands of the right people. Mm -hmm. to here, then to the clearinghouse. Uh, because so much stuff goes through a principal's day and then and whatnot. Maybe they just don't know. And going back to the yellow that you were mentioning, I was thinking about it and I said, well, even though it's the why is not answered, but those people can help us to design for those kids to come in after them. That these are the things that we need to make sure that uh, these kids are exposed to so they won't end up in the yellow. <coughs> so you know, it's, it, it's still a win-win kind of type of situation there. When I when I saw it in the board materials, I said, I never heard of it in all honesty. But but what it can provide and what it can do is just <coughs> outstanding to me for a local to be able to move forward, especially the twenty-five top colleges and universities that kids go to, and they, that's the same thing. Now, Johnny might want to go to school A, but Johnny, here's what school A requires. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So then it's up to us as educators to provide those services to Johnny. Uh, I just applaud who, whomever came up with the idea of doing it. Uh, and now that we have something that is, is data driven and is secure, and it's helped us to design the future work for, the, for, for these kids. I, I can do that. Easy, easy to understand. <laughs> Not rocket science here. So, but I just think it's, it's, it's a great tool. Just another tool that's available to our, uh, our administrators out there to, to help kids become successful lifelong learners. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yep, just our question. Yeah. Yep, did you have anything? I do, just quickly. Thank you. Uh, thank you again for the presentation. I recall it during our pre-board meeting a couple, maybe three weeks ago. My question is uh, this. I wonder if this data are just on um, four-year institutions? No, they're in six-year also. Six years. Public and private and Okay. It would be really interesting to pull out, to disaggregate and pull out the um, two-year institutions to compare their persistence rate with the four-year institutions. And that is available in the PDF that you have, and it also does public and private in-state, out-of-state. You can see some of that persistence. That, would, that, that, would, that could tell us, give us another yeah. angle to think about Absolutely. in terms of persistence. And finally, I lost my other question. <laughs> we'll come. Okay. We'll come back. I, and, and I'm hearing from Amy that you asked exactly what she was thinking. I was like, that she, you asked exactly what she was thinking. wanted to echo what Mr. Hall had just said. As a classroom teacher, one of the things we do always, we are reflective in our practice, and it's really important that we have the end in mind. Like when I prepare fourth graders, it is to make sure that they can be successful beyond my classroom, beyond going to the fifth grade. Um, and so I would love to just emphasize that also, Prince, I love that the principal had emailed you, but I'm hoping that that principal, as well as you all are putting in the effort to also make sure teachers kind of have an idea as well, and this information is brought to their attention as well, so that we have the end goal in mind for our kids, and what other skills do I need to make sure that I'm leaning in on to help have them persist? So, just a thought. Thank you. 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 Thank
And just to piggyback off of that, you, um, Ms. Floyd said something that I, I say frequently, which is the purpose of fourth grade is not to get ready for fifth grade. And that's how the system of education is designed. It is designed for the teacher to be so focused on the following year that they can lose sight of the forest or the trees. And um, I, when, when, this di when Dr. Tippett, uh, who at that time was with My Future NC, the, the head of Carolina Demography, when, when this data was first uh, put together for early days of My Future NC, what it told us was that of all the students who graduate from North Carolina every year, only about 22 to 23% end up getting a four-year degree by the time they are 24 years old. And only 15% are doing so at a UNC system school. And so um, that, that, that either, that, to me that says a couple of things. Either the system isn't working for all students, which I think a lot of us would agree that it doesn't, or it means that we're not counting, that's just four-year degrees, so then I think when we included two-year degrees, it only jumped up to about 36%. So um, again, you know, it's, it's incredible when, when our teachers are, are, ab are ab have the tools and the support to say, yeah, I'm, I'm getting them ready for fifth grade, but, but I'm also getting them ready for what's going to happen after they cross the graduation stage. Um, if, if teachers aren't given that kind of um, freedom to think in that way, if they are only thinking about that end of grade test, then that is part of why we end up with so many kids in yellow. Thank you, Dr. Corn. We'll look forward to that. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. So um, this conversation makes me think about um, all the work that we have um, placed in developing a kindergarten readiness um, index, you know, and the list of criteria that we think that five-year-olds need to be successful in kindergarten. And if we're looking at how we want to impact this data, we should be looking at the same or we should be generating a new list of post-graduation um, readiness and a list of things on that list. And when we can tick off those checklists, yes, then, then that, that's what's going to move the other. Yes. All right. Many future discussions to come, I'm sure, on this data. So thank you. And we're, I mean, I think there's a lot of excitement about what this is going to provide for, for guidance for every level of education in the state. So thank you, Dr. Corey. Thank you. Um, next, we turn to another item of new business. We've, we've heard a couple times about our partnership with the Institute of Education Sciences, and today we are going to review um, their findings on assessing the long-term impacts of school extension programs on student re-engagement and learning recovery. So Dr. Mara, if you will lead us through this. Yes, ma'am. So thank you. Uh, happy New Year. It's a gay immigration morning for you.
um, the impacts of COVID, but what is the result of the programs that we're putting in place? And then can we feed that data back to the field to develop better, more effective programs that can make the most of the person and of the uh, time that we have? Yeah. And so with that, I'd like to uh, turn it back to Billy. Thank you. Thank you. So for Thank you. 
to look at the data and see if there are programs that had particularly stellar results that we could look at specifically how they were structuring the summer uh, programs and then sharing that or, or can you de drill down to that level?
A couple of questions. Well, well, one isn't a question. It's sort of I'm going to tag on a suggestion to um, Ms. Kamnet's point. Um, also, I think it would be important when you do the descriptive part of the report um, to know something about the characteristics of the teachers. Um, are they beginning teachers, mid-career, late-career? Just to know a little bit more about the profile of the of teachers who are in those programs. one other point. I noticed one of the frames, probably I didn't note the number of the frames, but going back maybe four or five frames, it may have been characteristics slash subgroup. I don't believe I saw American Indians listed, but I did see American Indians listed in a couple of other frames going forward participating in the same projects. <coughs> go back to what you were saying about do we know those programs that have shown to be effective in a short period of time, the summer program is a short period of time, that would be uh, very uh, acceptable to you. <coughs> and we, they, they designed those summer programs. And I'm going to just quickly add something. When I first looked at the, the correlation between e economically disadvantaged students and students of color, it's not new. It shows it again. And, and the question is, uh, now, I don't know the answer. I know it, and I don't know the, the answer when it comes to how do we get these kids that, that comes out of homes that is economically disadvantaged up to snuff? Is it more money? Is it more programming? Uh, just what is it? Because that is not new. And you can see that they are adding new ground. That is, uh, we're still here with them. And I, and I hope the day will come soon to where we talk about COVID-19 and its impact it, it happened. But we need to move away from that now and, and, and design programs that's good for students, regardless of. Because uh, I want us to use COVID-19 as the excuse. Yes, it, it's a point of time, but let's move on now and, and start doing what we know we need to, that, to do for teachers staying in those classrooms each and every day. Because the quality of education a child receives 
is directly related back to the problem that teaches that stands before them and, and how well prepared they are to deliver this word. Thank you. I was there to say because that, that keeps popping up on every screen that a disadvantaged child after the CDA trial are failing to, to, to go to the next grade. You just named it. And, and my superintendent as you mentioned uh, earlier, the fact that not preparing a child for the fourth grade, but for life. And I think we just need to get to that point. I, I, I mean, COVID-19, okay, but let's move on now. And those summer programs, those original programs, they work. And what are we going to do for those kids that's in those homes and homes that they have to visit? Thank you, Monica. Thank you so much. Any other questions? Thank you so much, Dr. Fuller. Great. And thank you, Dr. I really appreciate your presentation because this is a testament of like intentionality and how difficult that can be in a regular school year. So as we think about the, um, I know that they, they said the next steps was describing the characteristics of the program. I'm really looking forward to seeing like what were the intentional things that were done within the makeup of the program to drive <coughs> students towards success. So I think that's something that we can hold on to and take with us, not into just summer programming, but into school years. So just to put that out there, that that is intentional intervention and it's hard to do. Thank you so much. Um, maybe I'm, sorry. Oh. I'm, I'm gonna make a comment about Mr. Hall's comments and I agree with you entirely. The lifelong learning piece to me is uh, you teach the subjects and the skills at the proper grade level, but you also have to find a way to instill the love of learning. And another important piece to me, and as children get older, students get older in higher grades, if they see the purpose, if you, instead of teaching them just to add, subtract, multiply, and divide, but if they know the purpose and the usefulness that's going to come with that, and there have been, uh, I remember reading a school, and I think it was a middle or high school, that required an element in their instruction that aside from the skills, they taught the purpose of their subject and the purpose of the class they were teaching. It was required they have that unit. As a matter of fact, I think the units were written for them, and in a few years they were writing them themselves, the instructors were, and absentee, absenteeism uh, went down, mm -hmm. achievement went up, and I, I would venture to say disparities in the subgroups uh, started getting smaller, which I think is important too. But it, that thought just come to mind, and I felt compelled to share it. Thank you. Thank you. Glad you did. We have uh, one discussion item today, SLA 1, which is uh, a, a brief look 
and a report to the General Assembly on the Read to Achieve program that Dr. Ryan is going to share with us. Good morning, Vice. I mean, good morning, Chair Duncan, Vice Chair Duncan. I'm, I'll get this right in a minute. Let's start over. Good morning. Happy New Year. Welcome back. Good morning. Um, so I want to update you, and I'm, I'm honored to be here to update you on the literacy intervention plan submissions as well as the early literacy hiring update progress. Um, we're going to begin with early literacy intervention plans. Okay. So the legislation, as you may recall, requires that all LEAs submit their plans by no later than October 1st. And the Office of Early Learning appointed a committee in collaboration with IABS to review the LEA submissions. And those submissions were aligned with the requirements approved by the State Board of Ed in October 2021. So I'm happy to report 100% of those LEAs, as I mentioned before, did submit their plans on time, and they have been reviewed. So the next slide will show you the breakdown, and you have a link directly there to each district's uh, intervention plan. Um, Twelve of those were approved without any recommendations at all. 103 were approved with recommendations, and denied were zero. And if you'll remember, this is our first year of implementation. We're in that initial year for this, and, and some of our districts just started letters training for the first time this fall. So we're moving in the right directions, uh, in the right direction, and it will get more specific over time. The plans are very general right now because that's where we are in training districts and making sure they understand um, what science of reading really is and what supports they need when it comes to curriculum environment and instruction. Um, and we are continuing to provide ongoing support so that we have more approved without recommendations. Um, and that just basically means that there were things in there we gave feedback on for them to consider updating, and they've gone back. And it's a live document, so they can change that at any given time um, without resubmitting anything. But I did want to get the breakdown to you because this is a report that will go to JLOC or we'll share it with them. Um, the second update will be around the early literacy specialists and the North Carolina literacy facilitators work. Um, if you'll remember, we have hired um, five of our six literacy facilitators, and to date, uh, they have helped with the science of reading, the ongoing training to help save us some costs uh, long term. And so we've facilitated in two months 19 early childhood letters trainings, um, 43 K-5 letters training sessions, um, with including over 1,000 educators that we're now starting to train um, internally as we move away from the contract eventually and saving costs there. And then on the next slide, I believe, you will have an update here. We have, if you look, the west and the northwest are lighting up the map. Um, they are on, on fire here when it comes to knowing how to recruit and help us um, in collaboration with placing early literacy specialists. And so this map is a live link. If you use this image, you'll see as we update these, um, you'll see what districts have a person in place or being hired. We've reviewed, received and reviewed over 200 applications. We've had a 110 phone screenings, 65 panel interviews in collaboration with a district representative or district representatives if they're applying for more than one district. 45 are either hired or in the hiring process right now, um, with five waiting to be placed, so approximately 50. Um, and so we're moving pretty quick. And only three of those are leaving their district for another district, and that we work with them. I work with each district on what the best time is because we recognize districts are in different places based on hardships and vacancies. Um, so in a short amount of time, we are almost at 50 um, hires, which those are all highly qualified, have had coaching experience, and they're coaching someone already, not necessarily coming for straight from a classroom to coach at the school level, district level, and state level. That would, um, so we're, we're making sure they're highly qualified there. And then on the next slide, um, we've held two onboarding sessions for those who are already in progress. And our first in-person collaborative date with those that will be that are hired will be in March. Um, so we're and we're working with district reps to make sure that they have any questions. We have monthly meetings with them to talk about how to support this process and support their person. And then our final update is related to um, Amplify the 2022-23 beginning of year data. Um, we have had a chance to review that and share that in the outcomes internally. We're going to ask that you stay tuned because Superintendent Truett will be sharing that tomorrow in her superintendent's report. And great things are already starting to happen for North Carolina. So we're extremely excited, and we appreciate your support and, and processes that we're implementing. And I will entertain questions. Questions for Dr. Ryan? Are we uh, directing more resources toward the districts that are really struggling and trying to hire so uh, not necessarily more resources as much as just conversations about how can we support 
do you have individuals that you are um, that you know would be a good fit for your district? And what does that look like and how can we support them? Because as they're coming in, as you can imagine with any position, everybody's at different places with different strengths and different areas as we're gonna we'll follow up to support them. But our OEL consultants are doing a great job with helping reach out there as well as our regional directors um, to see what we can do to help the districts. We are asking potentially for um, a consideration from General Assembly to increase the salary a bit for marketing and uh, purposes. Not sure if that's going to be um, accepted or not, but but it's something we're looking at as well for for districts where they say a teacher's being paid at that amount already. Let me see. Candidates will now turn to the Education, Innovation, and Charter Schools, led by Ms. Amy White. Ms. White. Thank you, Chair Davis. Good morning. This is Amy White. I'm the Chair of the Education, Innovation, and Charter School Committee. I share that responsibility with your candidates. Today we have um, two action items and two items for discussion. Um, most of those are charter school issues, so I'm going to invite, invite um, Ms. Ashley DeCaro um, to the podium to lead us in those discussions. Today, we have a special guest. The Vice Chair of the Charter School Advisory um, Board is Mr. Bruce Friend, and he is here in person to answer questions that the board may have regarding both the accelerated applications and the standard timeline charter school applications. And also, joining us online is Ms. Cheryl Turner. Um, so she is, I'm, I'm gonna just double check to make sure that she has connected. While we're waiting to get that response, Ms. Turner. Yes, ma'am, I'm connected. Good morning, uh, Ms. Turner. Thank you so much. And Ms. Turner is the chair of the Charter School Advisory Board. So let's um, turn to um, EICS 1, which is a, um, a, a revisit of the 2022 Accelerated Charter School Application. Um, recommendations. If you'll remember, board members, we had those before us for action. Um, in December, we had quite a robust discussion and lots of questions, and we um, had two that did not uh, make it through um, for approval, and so Charter School Law um, asked that those schools be sent back to Charter School Advisory Board, which they were, for additional review and recommendations. So, Ms. McCarrow, um, so if you're listening on Thank you very much. Ms. McCarroll, I'll turn the okay. discussion over to you at this point. Okay, welcome, thank, Mr. Friend. thank you very much. Um, good morning, Lieutenant uh, Governor Robinson, Superintendent Truitt, Chair Davis, Vice Chair Duncan, board members and advisors. 
Um, my name is Ashley Vicaro from the Office of Charter Schools. We are going to talk about the accelerated applications right now. Later in the presentation, we will focus on the standard applications. Um, charter school applications go through a yearly cycle. Our cycle for 2022 ended at the end of April. Um, we had several months of external in-staff DPI and CSAB um, evaluations and reviews. In September of 2022, we started our capacity interviews, which took place monthly through December. In December um, of last year, I presented the accelerated applications for you for um, discussion, and two of those were returned back to the CSAB. Those were heard by the CSAB on December 5th. Um, as a reminder, there is a policy, Charter 012, which says that prior to denying any charter school application that received a majority vote to approve by the CSAB, the, C the state board, so your board, must return the application to CSAB for further review. That took place, um, and we have two um, recommendations to you. Again, they are approvals. As a quick reminder, these are accelerated applications. So these two schools, if they are approved, they are currently in the planning year process, and they continue on that contingent upon your approval. If approved, they will continue that process, and then they would be slated to open in fall of 2023. Um, no impact statements were, were submitted for any of these accelerated applications. The two applications that were returned to CSAB for second review, both partner with an EMO. Uh, the definition for an EMO and a CMO is actually explicitly stated in North Carolina Administrative Code. So an EMO is a for-profit organization that contracts with new or existing public school districts, charter school districts, and charter schools to operate and manage one or multiple charter schools. The charter agreement, which we often refer to as the charter, is between the state board and the nonprofit applicant board. The charter agreement is not between an EMO and your board or the state. Um, instead, what happens is if a school decides to partner with an EMO or a CMO, that nonprofit board would enter into a service agreement or a contract with that management organization, and that contract outlines what services are being provided and what is in the case of an EMO, what the fee is. Um, both of the EMO agreements in uh, reference to these two applications were reviewed by legal staff. The first school um, I will speak about is American Leadership Academy, Monroe. This school is proposing to open in Union County, and um, there was a robust discussion at CSAB um, during the first and the second interview during the December um, 2nd review, the EMO and the board has a, had a chance to speak with the CSAB, answer questions, and, and undergo an interview. A, um, several issues were addressed. First of all, um, a big issue that has come up in discussions is the capacity of the EMO Charter, school, uh, Charter 1, which has currently has six operating schools in North Carolina, and there has been questions about um, whether that is too many, whether it's moving too fast. Um, Etc. Some of the issues or some of the um, points that came up during discussion with the CSAB members um, and that, I, it, that appear to have influenced the votes in support um, are the fact that Charter One is a, is a big organization with success in um, other states, with great resources. Um, they've successfully opened um, large schools and they have um, entered into contracts with other schools here in North Carolina. They have a building secured, which is required for acceleration. They have a leader secured, and they have over a 1,000 families that have shown um, interest to enroll in the school. In addition, for the capacity, a discussion um, occurred regarding the standard application that they had also submitted for ALA Garner, and the, um, the board and the board agreed to withdraw that application so that they could focus on ALA Monroe and hopefully um, alleviate some of the concerns about the rates of growth and capacity of the EMO. Um, that will, the Garner application will be discussed in the standard applications, but they have withdrawn officially to our office, so that, is no, that application is no longer under consideration. There was also discussion um, about whether um, a board deciding to utilize an EMO, if, that is, if they, they are being punished for doing that, um, if they, there's discussion about um, profit in the educational system and, and what, you know, if profit um, 
what is allowed and what is not allowed, what is um, kind of the pros and cons of that, and then autonomy of, board, of the board versus the EMO. The original vote for ALA Monroe was seven in support, two opposed, and two recused. That was the vote in September. The second vote was also seven in support, one opposed, uh, Mr. Sanchez, two, the same two recused, and then there was just one less vote because uh, Mr. Stoops is no, or Dr. Stoops is no longer on the board. The, um, so again, the approval, the recommendation was submitted in um, contingent upon the withdrawal of ALA Garner. That occurred, and the service agreement was reviewed by state council. Um, the second school was Legacy Classical Academy. This school is proposing to locate in Rockingham. It would be the only charter option for elementary school students in that county, um, unless it's a well, charter school option. Most uh, families that would prefer a different option are paying for private school. Um, the board came again to CSAB and spoke extensively about the need, about their commitment to the school. Um, the support for, the, um, for this application from CSAB stemmed upon the um, improvements that have been made on the application. This was a repeat applicant, so they had come before and um, requested an app, you know, submitted an application, gone through the process, and were um, denied. So they, they spoke a lot about that, the fact that there is a facility they would be leasing space from a church. Um, and then um, Eric Sanchez, who was the, the opposition, um, his concerns really focused um, mostly on uh, concerns about the EMO and um, just philosophical differences about, about EMOs. Their, um, this EMO, American Traditional Academies, is a new EMO, so they do, we do not have a history um, of operations for this school, but the um, managing partner, Mary Catherine, so Mary Catherine Sawyer, has opened three charter schools previously that have been successful, um, Cornerstone, Piedmont, and um, Revolution Academy. The first vote was 10 in support and one opposed. The second vote was now seven in support, um, one opposed, Mr. Sanchez. And the, um, the difference in the support is because we had two absentees for this vote, and we also had uh, Dr. Stoops, who was no longer on the board. In addition, um, this EMO, this new EMO, American Traditional Academies, they did also submit two standard applications, and those have been denied. So if this application is approved, it would be the first school for this EMO to, to open. Um, and at this time, I'll ask if there's any questions, if you'd like Mr. Friend to come up and speak to anything um, that was discussed amongst board members. Questions from board members? recommendations and the discussions that um, have provided those recommendations. Yes. Um, Superintendent Truitt. Thank you. So the same person has, oppo <coughs> excuse me, has opposed both applications that are both tied to EMOs? Correct. Or, okay. And so the is the opposition from Mr. Sanchez um, you, you say it stated philosophical differences. I think there's some the case for both. Um, I think also with um, Charter One, there's some you know there's some concerns from Mr. Sanchez that the rate of growth is um, quick without having a lot of data from North Carolina schools. But that's is that because there wasn't COVID data data during COVID? Correct. Okay. for the standard timeline charter school applications. Let's do EICS2 first, and that is a request from Aspire Trade High School to implement a weighted lottery. Ms. Becerra. Yes, this was presented um, last month. There were no questions. Um, I have no updates, but this is a planning year school um, projected opening next fall. will be a um, career and technical training focused high school, and they um, would like to start their lottery pro um, process or, or I guess um, have their lottery pulled in the next couple of months, and so they're asking for a weighted lottery um, so that they can uh, wait to give extra advantage to economically disadvantaged students. Okay. Question about this request 
from the Spire trade to implement that labor moderator. <coughs> Wonderful. All right, so let's move to our two discussion items. EICS 3 is the standard timeline charter school application recommendations coming to you from the Charter School Advisory Board. Um, on October, excuse me, on April the 29th of 2022, 16 standard timeline applicants submitted applications ahead of the 5 p.m. deadline. Um, from May until August, I want to remind you that Charter School Advisory Board spends an extraordinary amount of time going through these applications, interviewing them, um, reviewing them, and um, it's through that process and that interview process that they come to us with the recommendations. The uh, Charter School Advisory Board met in September on the 12th and 13th, in October, in November, in December, and according to the consistency with our approved timeline, all application recommendations were finalized in time in order um, to get them to us here in January. I'm going to turn the podium back over to Ms. Vaccaro, who will give us the highlights. Mm -hmm. uh, again, remind you that uh, Ms. Turner and Ms. Refren are here to talk about any recommendations or discussions that were held at the Charter School Advisory Board. Four applications of the initial 16 withdrew. Seven were recommended for approval. Five applicants were not recommended, and I do believe that um, we had the withdrawal of a length honor, so that um, takes our number down to... That's the seven includes. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Ms. McCarrow? Yes. Um, so we're going to continue with the Charter School application discussion. At this time, we're talking about the standard timeline applicants. So in this case, these applicants, um, once approved by this board, um, would enter the RTO, the ready to open and planning year phase. Um, and they would plan, they would have that time for over a year and they would be slated to open in the fall of 2024. So this is the, the regular timeline, so to speak. Um, and as Ms. White stated, we had four withdrawals, seven recommended for approval and five were not recommended. Um, of the seven that have been approved, um, by CSAB that have been recommended for approval. There were four impact statements submitted. Those have been posted on eBoard. Um, Wake County submitted one for Heritage Collegiate Leadership Academy Wake. Cumberland County submitted one for Agape Achievement Academy. And Charlotte Mecklenburg submitted um, impact statements for Movement West and Movement North East. Um, all seven recommended applications received unanimous approval from CSAB. Um, and we can now start going into the actual um, recommendations, starting with Movement School West Charlotte. I think it's one, one or two up. Are you? Good morning, and uh, thank you for your, your time and, and listening to the, the, the work that the CSAP has done. Uh, as Ashley indicated, there are, uh, of all the applications that we reviewed for this cycle, uh, there are seven that the CSAP unanimous, unanimously are recommending to you for approval. Um, there was this one slide back that showed the breakdown by just by the actual LEA that they were actually in. Um, and then there were, um, as, as, as mentioned, a, a few that were not that were, uh, recommended or one that was pulled, the ALI Garner. Um, the, the first um, one that we're presenting to you here this morning uh, is from Movement School West Charlotte. Uh, actually, Movement has three schools that we're recommending uh, to you. Um, this would be, as you can see, a, eventually a K, um, K-5 school with upwards of 542 students uh, in the Charlotte, West Charlotte area. Um, movement school, and I don't know if we want to go through these individually or kind of lump them together, um, do them together. So there's Movement School uh, West Charlotte, Movement School Northeast Charlotte, and Movement School Raleigh uh, coming a little bit eastward. Uh, Movement School actually uh, operates three schools in the state already with a total enrollment of 1,061 students uh, with a single governing board that oversees um, all three of their schools and would, with these three schools as well. The next school uh, that we're recommending is Flat Rock Pro Classical Academy in Henderson County. Again, a capacity of uh, K-8 eventually in year five of close to 400 students, 396 students. 
Um, I think Ashley indicated too, all of these schools that we're recommending here uh, in this cycle uh, do not have an EMO um, at, at assigned to them as well. But this one would be in Henderson County. The next school is Riverside, Riverside Leadership Academy in Craven. Again, proposed to be a, a K-12 school uh, uh, by year six um, at capacity of 780 students starting K-7 in, in the first year. The next one is Heritage Collegiate Leadership Academy in Wake County. Um, this would be a school eventually of uh, K through eight of 600 students starting K through six with uh, 440 students um, to be located in Wake County um, uh, in the sort of East, East Raleigh area um, is what they have in mind for that particular school. This is actually a repeat applicant. Uh, this, is a, this is an applicant that has come before CSAB, I believe actually um, this is the third year in a row, I believe, that they've been back to us. Um, and this is the first time that we're actually recommending them for approval. I share that because um, I know I speak on behalf of my fellow CSAB members. We take a lot of time and work, as you do, uh, in reviewing all of these applicants. And I will say it's, um, if I can use the word refreshing, I don't know if that's the right word to use, but when you do deny an applicant, uh, we always try to give them suggestions for how they can improve their application. And uh, sometimes we encourage them to come back and sometimes we don't, to be honest. Um, but when applicants come back and have addressed the concerns from previous cycles, um, that does resonate. And in this case, um, the Heritage Collegiate, we felt, had a much stronger application uh, this time around, a, a very strong board as well. The same can be said with Agape Achievement, the last of the seven, uh, a repeat applicant that came before us two years ago, last year, I should say. Um, again, listened to the concerns that CSAB members raised, um, tightened up some areas of their education plan, I believe some of their budget, very strong board, we believe. Um, and again, it's the, the last of the seven that we're recommending for approval. So with that, um, I'm here to answer any questions you may have. Um, I have uh, Chair Turner on the phone as well, and then obviously Ms. Picard from the Office of Charter Schools. these up and uh, talk about the movement schools. Are there any questions from board members about the proposal for the, the movement schools? There are three of those, two in Charlotte and one in Raleigh. Vice Chair Duncan? Uh, yes, Dave, good morning, Mr. Craig. Good morning. Um, and thank you for being here and for your work on CSAB. The, uh, as I look through the materials on the movement schools, Questions raised, first of all, about it was marked in the applications that they were non replicative uh, schools. And the reviewers appeared to question that they, in fact, were replicative. In fact, their mission statements appeared to be identical by way of example. Uh, what, what significance did that have for the committee, and how did you deal with that as you were looking at that issue? Yeah, I'm trying to, re re you read so many of these, I'm trying to. Uh, yeah, I get me. <laughs> you know, too. you know, um, I don't think they actually, yeah, I actually don't think we did. I remember that coming up in discussion, but I actually don't think they, by the, if I'm correct and you correct me, that by the definition of replication, that they met that standard. Is that correct, Ashley? Yeah, the, the di well, there's, there's two different replications. So replication has just like the model replicating movement schools would probably be considered a replication. But there's also fast track replication, and that's where it has specific requirements that schools must meet. And in this case, these aren't fast track replications because they're not trying to be accelerated. So that, that just goes to me, for replication, this is really for future knowledge. Mm -hmm. If a replication is checked, that is going for fast track as opposed to going for the normal consideration. Correct. And we are actually in the process of trying to. Um, make that clear on the application because there's been confusion about that. But the the, the only um, fast track replication, just like acceleration, has very specific requirements that are a higher um, standard. And in this case, the movement schools is not fast track. As I look at the application process, and you can feel free to ignore this comment, but I think it would be helpful to have a little more explanation to the applicants about what that means. So I think it'd be pretty easy to answer that question incorrectly mm -hmm. without 
absolutely. Yep, and we've, we've been talking about that. Um, second question um, with respect to moving school. There was a concern expressed uh, by reviewers and uh, there was some discussion I saw in the committee minutes to the effect that uh, moving schools uh, perhaps didn't have the same kind of knowledge about the Wade County area that would be necessary to be successful that they might have with respect to the Mecklenburg County mm -hmm. area. Uh, can the committee address that at all? And if so, what was the answer? Yeah, we, we actually I do remember that discussion as well. And I actually think if, um, that they have committed to actually having Raleigh representation on their board of directors that they have on their board. Um, the, the, so they're not all from the Charlotte or, or Western North Carolina area. Which leads to the next question. How much commonality is there on these three boards and the other three moving school boards? Uh, it's my understanding that it's one board that's operating all, managing all three of the schools. So then the Wayne yep. County board would be the first board that wouldn't have 100% duplication of board members? I believe that is correct. Um, I mean, there might be one of their current schools that has one board member who's not on the other school, but I, I don't think that that is the case, sir. And did the committee spend any time with respect to concerns with respect with relating to common governance of what would now be six charter schools in the state? Yeah, we did. I, I think any time that we have uh, a, a, a board that is managing multiple schools or presumably would be managing multiple schools, that's something that we, we absolutely take under consideration when we're reviewing the applications. You know, we ask questions about do they have the capacity, do they have the bandwidth, do they have the um, personnel in place within North Carolina to, to really provide a proper oversight and governance of the schools. And in this case, with movement, we felt uh, that they've demonstrated the ability to do that with the three schools that they already have. Well, movement's board, if it's you know, essentially identical to CSAP apparently thought six was six identical boards for the same capacity, what, what's the number when it goes outside the capacity? How many, how many schools do you have to have in the same board? I don't think legislative there's any limit to... Uh, I would yeah. really mean it legally. I meant yeah. your judgment with respect to assuring independence of the government's body and appropriate ability to review the work of the school and <coughs> Well, I'm, I'm, I'm one CSEP member, so I don't speak on behalf of the entire committee. I, I, I think that from my perspective, that's a hard question to answer without knowing the application that would be before me uh, to review. Could Is it possible that one board could manage 10 schools, 20 schools? I mean, I, I don't know if I could put a number on it until I actually saw and, and read more about the application and, and to know the capacity and the experience uh, of the individual board members as well. So I, I hesitate to say it's five, it's six. I think that's that would be a really difficult assumption to make that, that there's a magic number that um, a board can manage. Some boards wouldn't be, some boards, I mean, I, I, I'll speak for my own school. I'm, I, have, I run a charter school in Holly Springs. I'm pretty sure that my board wants to manage one school and that's it. Uh, and that's their capacity limit and, and desire to, to manage. So from your standpoint, I don't recall my time at CSEP having discussions specifically about is there a number that we wouldn't allow a single board to manage this, like if they go over this number, no, we wouldn't, we wouldn't allow that. Uh, but we have certainly, to be clear, had discussions at CSEP uh, around the capacity of any board to manage multiple schools, whether it's two, whether it's ten, um, well, probably not that many, but... Um, those are always discussions that we have. Anytime we have an applicant become before us or a board become before us, they may be looking to, to manage multiple multiple schools. I mean, as, as an example, if I may, go back to the accelerated um, recommendations. We had the, the one school legacy that actually had three applica applications before us, one accelerated, uh, two that were on this traditional timeline. Um, we had great discussion about the capacity of that new EMO to have three schools opening up over the next two years. Um, we did not recommend uh, two of their standard applications, feeling more comfortable with them being focused on getting this first accelerated off the ground. Last question on these schools. There was an impact statement made on behalf of Charlotte Mecklenburg schools um, in, in which they 
have set out concerns with respect to the opening of these schools for the committee to consider. What what were those concerns, and how what was the deliberation of the committee about those concerns? Yeah, I don't. Ha I unfortunately don't have that impact statement right in front of me. And um, Cheryl Turner, if you if you remember that directly, feel free to chime in online. Um, I'll just say this: any again, any time that we have an impact statement from an LEA. Uh, we take our due diligence in reading through it, trying to understand what their concerns might be about having uh, the proposed charter school open up in their in their LEA. Um, you've, all of you have read these applications as well I, and, and read impact statements as well. I, there is, um, in my opinion, often a lot of common language used and common um, uh, reasons given as to why they wouldn't want the school open particularly. Um, I apologize, I don't have that one right in front of me at this time to to, to, to speak specifically about the one for movement. Cheryl, did you, do you have anything to add on that? Unfortunately, movement schools is something I'm recused from because okay. I helped start that first school, so I can't speak to this one. That, that impact yeah. statement is um, available um, in our documents, and um, yeah, as right. are the um, discussions okay. by CSEP, so should, yeah. you could go back through and, and, and re -read just to refresh. I didn't see the discussion. <laughs> I think most of the, the conversation um, around in regards to the impact statement come up, came up actually from the um, applicant when they when they addressed the board and a lot of the, um, the the CMS impact statement focuses on demographics and the declining population in, in certain areas of Charlotte and um, I think the applicant's response to that was in terms of this um, with three schools they they only have over a thousand students and these schools start very small they start with I think is 120. Um, their first year, and so they felt like they could definitely have that enrollment despite the, um, and that was kind of their rebuttal to the, the capacity issue. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Gaines. Uh, just for my information, the three uh, operating schools, how long have they been in existence? Can I answer that? Yeah, um, a couple of years, movement um, school, uh, sometimes called movement freedom, I believe maybe three or four years. Um, Southwest just opened this year, and Eastland, I believe, last year. So fairly, fairly new. So, and we, so that means we have the same problem here that we had with the other schools that we discussed in terms of data. Yes, they have submitted, um, and they spoke extensively at CSEB about their in, their data that shows um, like their subgroup comparisons to the the county, and um, they they do target um, economically disadvantaged and minority students. And um, so there's extra data that was provided by the movement schools on eBoard. Um, and in addition, they, um, another issue too is that they start with K to one. So it takes a couple of years for them to get any data from the state. Um, any other questions about the movement schools, Superintendent Truitt? Well, I'm, I'm just curious about this, this, this issue of the number of schools that a board oversees. So, Help me understand, is it different from local LEA boards that are overseeing dozens to hundreds of schools? I would say no. But again, that's, um, I mean, you're, you're talking about most of these boards having, I mean, most charter school boards have responsible responsibility for one school across the state. But we do have those situations where we have schools, boards overseeing the management of or governance of multiple schools. But I think to your point um, that how many schools is the Wake County School Board overseeing? How many school, schools is the Watauga County School Board overseeing? Um, and, um, yeah. Thank you for the question. Let's move on then to the other schools um, that are before us for discussion today. Are there any other schools that anyone on the board would like to ask about a specific application? Uh, Superintendent Truett. So the first, let me go back to the presentation, the first application that was five to four, what was the? Now these, these were all unanimous, uh, 10 zero Votes on on these seven. Okay, am I thinking? Am I on a different one? No, I thought it was. Um, 
because um, was that the acceleration? Uh, I think that was it. I think it might be Garner. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. I yes, that's that. correct. Yeah, that was Garner. Okay. That was so the that one that split vote. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yes, but they they were they withdrawn. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, all, all seven of these from CSAB received a unanimous vote. Okay. My mistake. Thank you. Easy to make <laughs> when you're reviewing a lot of these. Any, uh, uh, Vice Chair Duncan. Thank you, Chair Knight. Uh, I'll try to be quick on this. Flat Rock Classical, in the review, there were questions raised about governments and possible conflicts in a, in a sorting out of what two nonprofits apparently involved in some way. Uh, have you, I, I couldn't see clarity of that in the CSAP board discussions about how that was resolved or if that was resolved. Just give, give me a moment if I may. Yeah, certainly. Yeah. And Cheryl, feel, feel free to chime in as well on Flat Rock. I don't remember that. Yeah, I don't. I think that had more to do with partnering with a nonprofit, but not two nonprofit um, boards or. Well, and there was also a question about affiliations with other schools and possible <coughs> trademark issues and materials. So all of those things were. It seemed like there was some sorting out that was uh, being uh, of exactly what the relationships were. It wasn't completely clear from the application. Okay. <laughs> That was discussed um, and and clarified in terms of um, there was a there was some confusion. We were confused, um, and so we felt probably other people would be confused too. But they did go through and explain all of the relationships to us, and there there weren't any that we that appeared to be conflicts. Yeah, and actually, if I remember, I was the one. I was the one on CSAB. We're probably not the only one, but I was a CSAB member that asked quite a few questions about their budget. Um, I seem to recall having questions about some of the um, whether they were budgeting enough to recruit qualified teachers, uh, particularly for high need students. Um, also, I believe there was a question about um, <coughs> technology as well. Um, in my mind, they answered those questions adequately. I think that that's part of also what they, any new charter school could sort of, you know, the budget they propose and what they end up with by the time they actually open. That's sort of what that ready to open year is about for them to kind of see that, well, maybe I didn't budget appropriately here. Need to move money over here. Um, but uh, we didn't find anything in their budget that gave us so much pause that isn't something that could be adjusted corrected during the ready to open process, ready to open year. Well, also on heritage, there was an impact statement that was supported by Wake County with respect to heritage as well, uh, which also included reference to past history of some of the participants mm-hmm. in this school being involved in the charter school year previously to close. Uh, could you address the committee's considerations about that and how that factored into the decision making? Yeah, that... Um, absolutely, and that was a, a point of great discussion, I can assure you. I think it's uh, fair to say that any time an applicant comes before CSAB, uh, and in this case it was an applicant who did, ma- did oversee a school um, that was assumed by another uh, charter um, EMO, uh, any time you have an applicant that has been involved in a school that, whether it was assumed or shut down, um, as you can imagine, we're going to have lots of questions. Uh, what's changed? What did you learn from that experience? How will this situation be different? Um, I, will, I will share that personally, I had a lot of questions about that going into the process of reviewing this application from Heritage. Um, I was not on CSAB during the time that um, the, the proposed applicant was involved in another school that had been assumed. But I... I came at this with an open mind, and I listened a lot. I asked a lot of questions. I know my fellow CSAP members did as well. 
what we what we found in this particular application was a really solid education plan that we feel will work for particularly for the location of the students that they're planning to serve. Um, there's demand for this school as evidenced by the um, the the outreach that they've done and the collection of letters and names that they've received from parents and in the proposed community. Um, we felt the board was very strong, and none of the board, no, no of the, none of the board members that would receive if this is approved um, of this charter proposed charter heritage collegiate were a part of um, the other school that was assumed. Um, so we felt we we did ask those questions, and I think the minutes kind of bear that out that we had a lot of I, I dare say tough questions for the um, the board and the proposed leader of this school. Um, but I think we walked away feeling very confident in their ability to do this. And I dare say feeling that um, lessons learned from the past have been learned. or lessons, you know, There were lots of lessons to learn from the past, and, I, and we believe, believe it indeed that similar mistakes would not be made this time around. Um, Cheryl, do you want to chime in on that at all? <laughs> yes, I you know, actually was well. on the board yeah. um, right. when, when, when we had the issues with the previous school. And um, there were there were issues like almost non-existent board. That isn't what we saw this time. This was a very strong board. Um, there were um, issues with um, following through with getting things turned in. I think those are the lessons that were most learned. Um, I think that the school leader now gets it that this stuff cannot be ignored. You can't get to it later. Um, the school leader herself, um, the person that we dealt with several years ago, was a totally different human being than the person that was before us um, this time. The ed plan was very strong. The board was extremely strong. Um, the what, what I saw in the growth of the leader, um, I probably more than anybody was um, hesitant about the school because I was involved in all the issues that several years ago and I was t I was very convinced by the end in fact said so um, for the record that the growth was phenomenal and that I felt like the school had the opportunity to be successful yeah I, I, I would echo that I would say and I think I even made this comment um, at the end of the second interview Go going back to your very fair question about past history and the trust that we have to have that mistakes won't be made again. Um, I mean, I, I think that this was a solid this was a solid charter application, and I, this is again I'm not speaking on behalf of CSEP. I'm speaking on behalf of myself. If I hadn't known about some of the past history, I'm the one who made a motion for a second interview. I, I, that motion would have been for a first interview. Um, I really feel that this was a very strong application and a strong board. And with that ready to, year, ready to open year, they'll get it right. So I'll, I'll interject a question if, if I might, Vice Chair. So, so um, several of us were on this board <laughs> um, in that very turbulent transition. And not only were there um, issues of timeliness, timeliness in data management and remittal, there were also significant allegations of fiscal mismanagement and a very difficult time in the return of assets um, to the state. And so I'm going to tell you, I've, anybody can be anybody for 45 minutes, but mm -hmm. it's what mm -hmm. happens in practice um, and consistency that shows character. And so given what um, we went through as a board in the best interest of the students, whose education was compromised during that time. I'm going to share with you that I, I have some very strong reservations that um, that particular leader um, will, um, I, I, would have, I would have much more um, confidence given the fact that there's a strong board and a strong application, but that particular past practice is painting my review and I need to get that on the table because that was that was um, there were many students in that school that that suffered as a result of very significant poor mismanagement and to be clear it resulted in some hardship on the local district transpired recovery from those circumstances as well 
and significant yeah. time and, and time on DPI staff yeah. um, and legal team. Um, I, I, I'm just being transparent here. No, I appreciate that. On behalf of CSAB, I, I think that it's fair to say that I and every one of my colleagues in CSAB had some of those same concerns. And then, um, so not d dismissing them at all, but they were very real concerns. But as we went through the process and conducted two interviews, um, you know, as the unanimous vote would, would indicate, we felt uh, confident that um, this, this board, uh, if given the opportunity to have this charter school, will succeed. Okay, one last question. Vice Chair, last question. Literally last question. Yep. Um, on Agape Achievement Academy in Cumberland County, there was also an impact letter that was sent by Cumberland County. You indicated uh, I couldn't really see much that addressed in the minutes anyway, because uh, you all had a good discussion about it. Could you share with us what was addressed about the uh, impact letter from Cumberland County and how that was addressed by the, by the board? Yeah, and again, I apologize. I don't have that impact statement in front of me. I should have had that with me here today for both of these schools, so I do apologize. Um, I do remember discussing it, but honestly, probably in the same vein that we discuss a lot of the impact statements um, in terms of, um, you know, how is this school going to be different um, in, in the community? Is, is it, is there, are there other school options in this community? I um, mean, sometimes you get impact statements from, some districts that have a lot of school choice already. Uh, I think in this particular case, I don't believe that that's the case in Cumberland County. Um, Cheryl, do you, do you, on the fly, do you have the impact statement in front of you by chance, or? No, I'm uh, sorry, I don't. Right? Yeah, I apologize on that. Um, but this too is a school that um, we felt we, the board was outstanding. Um, this is another example of a school that uh, two years ago or last year at this time, we disappointed. They, they came before us. Um, I think they had even two interviews at that time as well. And um, they listened to what we had to say about their budget, about tightening up their education plan, about the importance of recruiting, um, not just waiting until after you get your charter, but being proactive to demonstrate to us that you can, you can reach these numbers. And this board did that, and they did an outstanding job, and they came back for us this time. So, again, this is an example of a school that we felt um, – Rightfully so, we didn't recommend them last year, but this year uh, they came back, li they listened to what we had to say, and I think it's apparent in the application and the interview that we conducted with them. Thank you for your time with us today and for the work on the board. Chair White, thank you. Thank you. Hi, Chair Duncan, always happy to accommodate your questions. Any other questions? I have a quick question. Dr. Oxendine. Uh, with respect to the impact letter, does that also include all, all options, school choice options available in a school district. And I'm talking about homeschool as well as private, parochial, as well as charter. Um, I'm not sure I'm going to answer your question exactly. So that, you know, as I think you know, an LEA does not have to submit an impact no, letter for any of these. That. Any of these. Um, typically what I find in the impact statements, and again, Cheryl, you've been at this longer than I have, um, I don't recall impact statements from LEAs that reference other non-public options like homeschooling or private school as the reason not to support a charter school. I think a lot of the impact statements, um, not to generalize, but often will read along the lines of, well, we're already doing this in this district, so we don't need to have that school. Um, or, or in some districts, um, there might be already... Uh, an abundance of charter options. And so they might use that as an example of why we do we really need another charter in this particular district. But Cheryl, do you do you have any insights on that? I don't, I don't recall impact statements that reference you know, don't approve a charter because or don't desire a charter because of other private schools or homeschooling options. I've never seen one that included that. Um, generally, it, they talk about options that, 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 that their district provides. Um, whether or not there are other charters in the area, um, and then financial impact. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hartzenstein. Thank you, um, Mr. Friend, for your time today. I know that takes you away from your, um, your, your day to day, which uh, involves uh, on the boots uh, leadership um, for, for our school and our area.
area. Um, Ms. Turner, thank you so much for um, being available today. Um, we have one last item for discussion. It's EICS 4. This is a request from West Triangle High School to change its managing nonprofit. So West Triangle High School is um, one of our approved charter applicants in its planning um, year, and it's scheduled to open in 2024. It's uh, supposed to locate in Orange County with uh, year one enrollment of 150 students. Um, this is going to be a high school 912. Um, when they submitted, um, um, they had um, a managing entity that was stated as the um, Center for Contemporary Science. It is before us with a request to change that managing enti entity to Triangle Schools, North Carolina. And before us is Ms. Ashley Vaccaro to walk us through the details. All right, thank you. Um, so this application, again, it's not a operating school at this point. It's in the planning process, um, the planning year. West Triangle High School was submitted in 2021 as a um, replication of Research Triangle High School, um, which is a, an established school, um, high-performing charter school in the state. The, um, the current uh, discussion school, West Triangle, is currently in a one-year delay that's pending within our office. Um, and they applied as a replication, but going back to your, um, your last point, Mr. Duncan, not as a fast-track replication. So they are replicating the educational model, which is a STEM model, a math and science school, um, of Research Triangle High School, but they, they didn't, um, they're not doing a fast-track, although they did actually meet all the qualifications to do that. Um, during the planning process, as they're preparing to finance a facility, there was a, an issue that arose, um, and it arose from a bond that, Research Triangle High School had um, entered into in 2015 to finance its facility. And within that bond language, there is a covenant that states all revenues received by um, contemporary science centers, so that the school's nonprofit, must be pledged to Research Triangle High School. Um, the issue is that that same nonprofit has applied for this current school, West Triangle High School. And in order to not conflict with the bond language, they needed to come up with a solution because those two nonprofits could not um, hold this, like could not govern the same school due to the fact that this bond um, language existed. The school worked um, extensively with our office, with their legal counsel. We've also had um, legal counsel here review this amendment. Um, and certain, um, there were other solutions looked at, like, for example, changing the bond language. That can take up to two years. Um, and so the, the solution we've come up with, and the board has um, unanimously approved the school's board and the CSAB board, is to create a new governing nonprofit for West Triangle High School. Um, this was approved in, unanimously by the uh, school's nonprofit board in September. The um, nonprofit was officially incorporated in October as Triangle Schools North Carolina. They have submitted a 501c3 to the um, application submitted to the federal government, and CSAB unanimously approved it in December uh, la this last month. The details of the request are simply that the name and composition of the nonprofit are changing. Nothing else in the application is changing. So the governing structures, educational plan, everything else in the application remains the same, but now they've created a new nonprofit that can um, eventually hold the charter once they get through the planning year. Um, for this new school, uh, West Triangle High School. In creating this new profit, uh, new nonprofit, they had certain board selection criteria um, that they wanted to make sure would put this board at a strong footing. They wanted um, board members that had experience during the Research Triangle startup years. They wanted um, longevity and tenure on the nonprofit uh, board for Research Triangle, so they had experience. And then they wanted some of the parents um, from the replication committee that had committed to trying to make this school a reality. The new board composition, um, you'll see on this slide, um, essentially what they did is they took the board and um, split it a bit. And so the new um, West Triangle High School board, should this, applicate, or should this amendment be approved, will be chaired by Alex Quigley, who many of you are familiar with. He has been a longtime board member with Research Triangle High School, and he runs a successful charter school. Um, two board members will remain on both of the boards. They have between five and seven years experience. And then two um, parents that are future prospective parents um, that were part of the replication committee. That would be the, um, so if this is approved, that entity would now 
be the governing body for this um, school that's in the planning year. Any questions? So during the committee, we had the discussion and we asked um, if you would please um, send it back to our legal team for them to review. Did I hear you say that they had had a chance to put eyeballs on that and um, make sure that um, mm -hmm. there was not anything that would um, cause us a legal issue? Yes. Ms. Schaefer reviewed it and um, stated that there was no legal barrier to this request. Okay, questions? Okay, thank you very much. That will be before uh, Vice Chair Duncan. It's actually sort of a technical question. I noticed 501c3 has been applied for. Mm, good question. My, my understanding is they usually take um, at least nine months and more mm -hmm. frequently lately even longer than that. Yep, the law is that they have to have um, their 501c3 status within 24 months of applying. So if the grants are charter in the meantime, they start up school and then the 501c3 doesn't come through, the charter gets revoked on that basis? Well, you, in that case, we wouldn't actually, you wouldn't actually grant the charter because this is um, just a planning, like they're in the planning process, so they have to successfully go through the entire ready-to-open process, and that's usually... Um, if you recall, that usually happens in the summer when we bring you all of the schools that are preparing to open and we talk about whether they have, like, their educational certificate of occupancy, if they have their 501c3. Yeah. yeah. So if they were to come back to us this summer but they don't have their 501c3 yet, that is still in process. Then they wouldn't be able to open. Um, but they are currently pending a delay, so they, they have another – they would have until fall of 2024. Okay. But I, and I was really asking the abstract. Yeah. Understand. Yep, that's great. That's question, correct. Though. Excellent. Any other questions from board members? Okay, well then I'll close out the discussion. Um, thank you for your uh, participation in today's uh, Education, Innovation, and Charter School Committee. And Mr. Chair, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you, Ms. White. We'll now break for lunch and return at 1 p.m. 1 p.m.